Okay, so the poem that I was assigned to do was uh, Crossing the Swamp. Yeah, those are my annotations. So, to begin, let's start with the title. So, the title really doesn't reveal much um, other than the possible, other than there might be a possible journey with the crossing, the word crossing, yeah. So, moving on to. Oh, the title, it sets a tone that's sort of like, I don't know, adventurous. And so just about the subject, I mean, not much. It's about a journey, and that's about, that's about as much as I got out of it. So the purpose. Um, the purpose, it's to describe, and it's to describe this particular swamp. And whether or not this, pump, this swamp is a symbol for something... Um, will be discussed later on, hopefully, if I have enough time. So, going down to the speaker. So the speaker is some sort of adventurer or traveler in this poem. Um, that's, uh, that's apparent with the fact that uh, he is trying, he or she is trying for a foothold, finger hold, or mind hold over slit crossings, deep hip holes, and all that. The setting, as the title suggests, is a swamp. Um, and with it being a swamp, it also means it is wet. It is thick, it is muddy, and it is very hostile to humans unless you are unless you're unless you're one of the swamp people, which you're not, so whatevs. Um I'm going on to the verbs. So there aren't actually very many verbs in this poem until you get towards the end. And I guess and I feel like the lack of poems kind of no, lack of poems, what the hell? Uh, lack of verbs suggests that it, that the reader should be focusing mainly on the description provided by the speaker rather than what the speaker is actually doing. Okay, so um, tension. So there are a couple, there are, there are two main sources of tension in this poem. Um, it actually begins at in line one with the words "endless wet to thick cosmos," and it. I like there's only one, but it continues on throughout the first two thirds of the poem, beginning with endless but thick cosmos and ending with black slack earth soup. From then on, the tone gets uh, gets significantly more positive. Um, the tension actually I feel increases throughout the poem until you get to black slack earth soup, because it starts with uh, talking about the wet thick cosmos. And then talks, and then ends with talking about slate crossings, deep hip holes, hummocks that sink silently into the black slack earth soup. And all of that just sounds like a horror movie to me. It sounds like something. It sounds like a nightmare. Okay, and then to the tone. So the tone is very dark and ominous. Um, at least, especially throughout the first two thirds or so of the poem, um, you can tell that from uh, the diction used. It's, the diction used is always very, it has a very negative connotation. Um, it, I'll show you. So, we can start with um, uh, wet and thick. That's, both of those aren't very positive words. They aren't very uplifting words. They're very dark. And especially with thick, it's, it's a, it, means, it literally means restrictive. <coughs> Then with dark bird, faintly belching bogs. Dark, again, going back to the very dark tone. And um, bird, birds are essentially these little things. I don't know what they are, but they stick to your socks when you go hiking. So they aren't very comfortable. Um, okay, and then the images that the, uh, that the speaker produces, especially with the intricate description. With the dark bird, faintly belching bogs. Belching a, a kind of... When talking about a bog, it brings to mind two different images. One is like so like a bubbling ground, like you see like gas bubbles come up and like come up and open up above the surface, which is rather disturbing. And um, that's not second one's not an image, but it's a sound. You hear someone belch as they've had too much to eat or drink. Yeah, drink. So. Um, Hopefully my voice is coming across okay. But, okay, we'll move on down to the diction. 
So, a specific diction in this poem, um, like I was talking about earlier, the endless weft thick cosmos. I'm going to concentrate on endless and endless and cosmos to begin with. So, um, endless and cosmos, those essentially imply that it's because when the author or the speaker says, here is the endless wet thick cosmos, the center of everything, it, it implies that the swamp is everything and anything. Um, the only thing that exists is the swamp. So that, that, uh, that automatically sets a very ominous tone. Um, and then again, wet and thick, that's very restrictive, especially to human movement. Um, people, people get swallowed up by mud. Um, thick mud. That's what quick mud and quick sand is. Um, and then moving down, uh, again, again with a very restrictive and very thick sounding words with dense sap. Um, again, dense, very restrictive to human movement or just a movement in general. Um, sap. That's what um, like bugs get caught in sap. And when it hardens, it becomes amber. So again, very restrictive, sort of frozen in time, but I don't think that has anything to do with this poem. And then dark bird faintly belching bogs. The words dark and faintly are both very subtle words, um, especially faintly, because it implies that it's on it's in the background, which especially for someone in this scenario would be uh, it would set them on edge. And I think I'm pretty sure it's meant to set the reader on edge as well. Okay, moving down to um, here we have deep hip holes, hummocks that sink silently into the black slack earth soup. So the word black and the word earth soup, earth soup isn't. I'm not even sure if it's a word, and if it is a word, it's not. It's not very widely used, and the fact that it's not very widely used, and the fact that it's foreign to most readers. Um, just amplifies that sense of ominousness. I don't know if that's a word, but ominousness. And it sets the reader on edge. It's kind of ironic because the sentence immediately afterwards is more uplifting and it changes the tone of the poem completely. Um, slit crossings and deep hip holes. Again, I'm not, you can't find any traction. You can't find any. Um, it's hard to move forward, especially in, in these environments. It, progress is very inhibited. Like you can go back to the very restrictive sense um, with the language used at the beginning of the poem. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to imagery. So imagery appeals to sight, sound, smell, taste, or touch. So again, um, when you're moving, looking at um, bird, uh, it's so it's very uncomfortable, um, so it appeals to your sense of if you've ever had burrs attached to your socks, you, you can probably imagine that it sucks. Um, but I mean, there's not really much in imagery here. Um, obviously, the author is creating some very intricate images with the language when he says, you know, uh, dense sap, branching vines, dark bird, faint, faintly belching bogs. And then moving it on down to, let's see, yeah, that, that's about it in terms of the imagery, but it does paint a very vivid picture. Uh, sound devices. No, figures of speech. Um, not really much in the way of figures of speech, but the, sen but the sentence at the end where it says, a, a bow after all, that still after all these years could take root, sprout, branch out, but make of its life a breathing palace. At least that's a metaphor. Um, and the effect of that metaf metaphor is to impress upon the reader that this is w essentially what you that what the point of this poem is, is essentially. Um, I don't know if that made any sense. So sound devices. There are a couple in here. Um, you have uh, some alliteration uh, with hip holes, hummocks, sink silently. And then going back up to, I believe, uh, somewhere else, if I'm, yes, uh, bird belching bogs. Uh, yeah, all of these, um, I'm not really sure what the effect of, uh, what, uh, what the effect on the poem is, but it does, it's not very melodious, which is kind of ironic because these are 
uh, sound devices, which are supposed to help enhance the poem. And they're not very melodious. They're actually kind of cacophonous. Um, bird and belching are very, especially on the first syllable, very um, emphatic on the first syllable, which is kind of cacophonous. And then moving on down to the sentence where it says, my bones knock together at the pale joint. The word knock is, is again cacophonous because, um, and the fact that it is cacophonous just, um, just exacerbates that uh, that fear factor that the speaker is feeling. Um, and then the structure of this poem, um, especially in the way that Mr. Reynolds gave it to us, um, it, the way that the words are actually uh, printed on the sheet, uh, it is very intricate in a way. The way I kind of looked at it, I may be looking too far into this, but um, it kind of looks like a path, a very winding path. Um, I actually drew a line down the middle of the poem, trying to find the path and what it looks like. But yeah, that's what I thought it looked like. And then a set, and again with um, with the syntax, the repetition of certain phrase, of certain um, parts of words, pathless, seamless, shit, pathless, seamless. Uh, Peerless, and then moving on down to foothold, fingerhold, and mind hold. Um, again, those, the fact that the author keeps using those, uh, and the fact that they don't really flow, just adds to the fear factor that um, that the speaker is trying to present. Um, there is just there are a couple senses of irony because um, as the tension hits its highest point, the author immediately switches and goes to a much more positive sense. After, I'll show you where. It says, into the black slack earth suit, I feel not so wet as much painted and glittered with the fat grassy mires. So, feel not wet, so not restrictive, so much as painted and glittered, which, come on, that's, ve that's not, that's very melodious, it's very euphonous sounding words. Fat grassy mires, again, fat implies a sense of vitality, health, and then rich succulent marrows again another sense of vitality so the tone shift is very very apparent because of the fact that the author essentially switches polarity extremely quickly like on the spot um ambiguity in this poem i could i thought i could find most of it i mean i didn't really think of it as too complicated and so i had 12 minutes so i better get going i don't want to go over 15 minutes okay see ya bye